Hussein Serritoglu é professor do Departamento de Engenharia e Ciências Mecânicas da Universidade de Illinois, em Urbana-Champaign, nos Estados Unidos. Ele obteve o título de bacharel é, em Engenharia Mecânica pela City University of London e os títulos de mestre e doutor em Mecânica Teórica e Aplicada pela mesma instituição em que hoje trabalha. Lidera o Programa de Controle de Fratura em Laboratório de Materiais de Alta Temperatura da Universidade de Illinois, onde ele também desenvolve projetos ligados à mecânica da fratura e materiais de alta entropia, incluindo ligas com memória de forma. Ele possui diversos projetos de pesquisa apoiados pela National Science Foundation, pela Força Aérea Americana, pelo Departamento de Energia dos Estados Unidos, por empresas como Rolls-Royce e Honeywell. Esses projetos versam, entre outros temas, sobre geração de energia a partir de efeitos de memória de forma, desenvolvimento de aços com alto teor de nitrogênio, fadiga termomecânica, fechamento de trincas, transformações de fase induzidas por tensão, plasticidade cíclica, ratcheting, e deslizamento de planos em metais. Devido às suas importantes contribuições na área de mecânica da fratura e comportamento da mecânica de metais, o professor Serritoglu foi homenageado com o Cannes International Award de 2020. Ele também é doutor honorário pela Universidade de Aalto e membro honorário da Associação Alemã de Pesquisa e Teste de Materiais desde 2015. Ele também recebeu a medalha Nadai da American Society of Mechanical Engineers em 2007. Além disso, ele é editor de diversos periódicos e publicou mais de 250 trabalhos em periódicos de relevância em engenharia. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you, Professor Kurka, uh, Professor uh, Bartolini, and uh, Professor uh, Otaliano uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm very pleased to um, uh, present uh, work uh, on fatigue thermomechanics, starting with thermomechanical fatigue, um, emphasizing the work we did uh, on uh, railroad wheels or wheel steels, and then I will talk a little bit about rails, and then I will uh, um, move towards modeling of fatigue uh, at the microstructural level if we have uh, enough time. So I want to, again, uh, Thank you for the opportunity. University of Illinois uh, is um, in the state of Illinois, uh, south of Chicago. Uh, we are a, a small city uh, with, the, with the university. I want to talk about uh, some historical background. Uh, I hope you can see my slide, yes. Can you see my slides? Okay. Yes, I can see. You can. Oh, no, 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 not not now. Just a moment, please. Yes. Not yet. Leonardo trying share to share again it. your screen. Okay, let's do it again. I see. Something happened. Almost there. Yeah, your screen is here, but not your slide specifically. Yeah, uh, now it's there. It's there. Um, yeah. Okay, Just... so this is uh, this was my first slide, uh, the beginning, and this is the my second slide, and I'm just starting now uh, with the outline of my talk. Can you see that? Yes. Just uh, just change the mode to presentation mode because it's uh, we are seeing oh. your. Okay, I can PowerPoint. do that. How is that? Yes, it's okay. You, Thank you. It's okay. Yeah, please, uh, please ask me questions or if you can't hear me or you don't see the slides, please let me know. Thank you. Excuse me, organizers. I cannot uh, switch my camera off. Is there do this?
Sorry about that. Just a moment. I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave the, the I'll leave the the program and, and return again then. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Before we start, Professor Fitzgerald, uh, may I ask you? You can drag the the lower part of your screen so that the presentation is bigger. No, right now. And then you you can press the plus sign on the lower left corner of your screen and set cast layout or something like that, so everybody okay. can see the presentation in a bigger stage. If it's clear. So. Oh. Yeah, yeah. You you can like uh, drag your your. Uh, your camera view, your your face, you can make it smaller, and then you uh, the presentation will be and you can broadcast this layout to the whole audience so everybody can see the presentation uh, in a bigger state. That's it. That's it. And on the that, there, that that's that's as far as it lets me. It doesn't let me go sw smaller than that. Yeah. So. Um, so you want me to go back here? Is this better? Uh, yeah, I think it's better. Then, then uh, now I think you can switch to the full screen mode. Yeah. How, how is that? Uh, okay, I'm switching now. Is okay. Yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah. Is Professor? is my pick? Yes. Let me. May I speak a few moments with our audience uh, just to clarify uh, some aspects? It's, it's one minute, all right? Sorry about that, Professor. So, yeah. So, uh, I'll start in Portuguese. So, bom, bem-vindos todos a, a o Simpósito Roviário. Eu sou Leonardo Barufal, de um dos organizadores. Aqui nós tá, estamos assistindo aí por streaming, né, por via ao vivo. Existe uma janelinha de chat ali do lado. Esse chat ele não é para ele não, não serve como um chat de YouTube em que todo mundo pode conversar, não é essa a ideia. A ideia é que sejam enviadas perguntas, os organizadores recebem essas perguntas e depois a gente formula elas para o professor Serritogu. Então fiquem à vontade para escrever perguntas naquela janelinha, elas vão ser recebidas é, aqui pela, pela organização e a gente faz uma filtragem depois. né? Às vezes são muitas perguntas, não dá para responder todas, mas a gente vai fazer as principais aí. And, and in English now, uh, for the guests that for the guests that are watching us uh, via streaming, uh, we have a chat window on the left corner of your screen. The chat window uh, window is more to make questions, so you can type a question there, and we will see what you talk or you type, and later we will ask Professor Hesahita Blue and answer those questions. Okay, thank you and so much. Now, now you're off. And for those you, who want to see the presentation in full screen, there is a sign on the right, Alternar Compartilhamento de Tela Cheia. Just click one. there, and your uh, screen will be bigger. Not for Professor Serrita Glue, it's for the audience, the audience now. Oh, it's for the audience, okay. Do you prefer, do you prefer this, or do you prefer this? Uh, the one coming up, this one. This one. This one. The second okay. one. Second one. Okay. We, so we do with the second one. Thank you. And uh, you can see my face while I'm speaking? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay, excellent. All right. So we, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, historical background uh, to fatigue. I'm going to speak about wheels and rails. And uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the role of grain boundaries uh, in fatigue, and then uh, some uh, predictive methods uh, for fatigue uh, fatigue damage. Um, so there are previous uh, publications, of course, on high temperatures, and uh, I like to share uh, some of these with you. Uh, there's one by uh, Peter, uh, Peter Skelton, and um, and uh, Remy. Uh, these are uh, 
uh, the publications on high temperature fatigue and on thermomechanical fatigue. Uh, we had a number of ASTM publications uh, covering um, thermo, thermo, thermal fatigue and thermomechanical fatigue of materials. A lot of these publications are in the 1990s, uh, some in the early 2000s. Um, and the, the one that uh, on the right the, uh, is probably one of the earlier ones by uh, Spera and Mowbray. And uh, this was a conference in Netherlands that uh, covered also thermomechanical fatigue. A lot of the things uh, that I'm going to talk about initially uh, are uh, also covered in volume 19 of the ASN handbook uh, on fatigue and fracture. Um, and uh, the chapter is called thermal and thermomechanical fatigue of structural alloys. Of course, uh, uh, the research on fatigue goes back uh, a long time, and one of the earliest examples of fatigue uh, occurred um, in 1844. And this is the, uh, I'm showing with my cursor. I hope you can see my cursor here. The, the failure at the, uh, at the fillet here in a railway axle. And this problem uh, caused a derailment in, the, in Versailles in, in, uh, in France. And uh, some of the people who studied the fatigue uh, of this axle, railroad axle, was uh, uh, the famous uh, Rankin, the, who was more famous for the thermodynamic Rankin cycle. And you could see here on the fracture surface that there is a, um, a, a crack, fatigue crack uh, zone, and then the final fracture is, uh, is, is, is in the middle. So, um, Fundamentally, the fatigue phenomena is associated with plasticity. Uh, plasticity can occur at local scales. And uh, Bauschinger, uh, which uh, people uh, I'm sure are familiar with his work, uh, showed that or postulated that the, uh, when the plastic strain in a hysteresis loop is of the order of 10 to the minus 4, the corresponding stress range is uh, should is the fatigue limit considered to be the fatigue limit. This was something he proposed many many years ago. Um, as far as the rail um, wheel contact uh, fatigue and thermomechanical fatigue, um, it it's been recognized uh, earlier on. Uh, in, in, a, in a book by Moore, H. F. Moore, who was a professor at the University of Illinois, uh, who was actually uh, a person who worked on fatigue, that the surface of these materials, the, the, the steels, the carbon steels, uh, can um, undergo a loss of carbon. And you could see here examples of uh, ferrite on the, on the rail surface. And then, in fact, the material uh, has a periodic structure, but it's surrounded by ferrite boundaries. So this clearly is a situation where the material would be much softer on the surface than it, than it should be. So there was recognition of some of the metallurgy associated with, uh, uh, with these materials as uh, early as 1930s. This is the seventh edition of this book. So um, as far as the historical background to uh, fatigue, I should point out that um, a lot of the work uh, has been done on three fronts, microstructure, continuum, and micromechanics. On the microstructure, uh, the work dates back to 1900, where people had an opportunity to observe fatigue cracks with the optical microscopes, and then goes uh, well into Today is 2000, 20, uh, 2020. On the continuum approach, the phenomenological models that people use in practice now, especially for high temperatures, Coffin and Manson. That is Manson and that's Coffin. And uh, Morrow was also involved with, uh, with the strain life kind of a predict predictions, predictive methodologies. Jodine Morrow was my advisor when I was in the theoretical applied mechanics department. This is Mugrabi, this is McEvely, and this is Ewing. 
on the micromechanics front, uh, there is T.H. Lind, uh, Mora, and uh, Peter Neumann from Germany. Uh, Mora and Lind are uh, professors in uh, are professors in the United States. So um, just to um, uh, show that uh, fatigue crack and nucleation occurs uh, at typically uh, occurs at or starts or initiates at grain boundaries, and these are probably grain favorable grain boundaries. And this you could see here. This is a favorable uh, slip system, most likely, and uh, there there are some uh, slip systems active here, slip bands that become fatigue cracks again, uh, and they could. These cracks could traverse across the grain, as shown in here. This is the picture after 1,000 reverses. This is the picture after 2,000 reverses. So there's, there's some cracking here, but they haven't grown, or they're not as visible. Uh, while here, it, it, this is the work of Ewing and Humphrey. Now, the McEvely and his, his uh, group also show that uh, the, these slip bands cannot penetrate easily through some grain boundaries, and there is a large stress concentration at the boundary, and this uh, is the cause of fatigue cracking in a uh, number of materials. This, uh, particularly, the, these boundaries, as shown here, are twin boundaries. Now, we start talking a little bit about thermomechanical fatigue. The thermomechanical fatigue is far more complicated, of course, than isothermal fatigue. You know, constant temperature fatigue. In thermomechanical fatigue, we and this is just an example. We raise the temperature from a minimum to a maximum and then back to a minimum again. So we cycle the temperature. And this is mechanical strain versus time. This is temperature versus time. Uh, if the strain, mechanical strain, is in phase with the temperature, it's called in phase thermomechanical fatigue. If the mechanical strain is out of phase with temperature, it's called out of phase thermomechanical fatigue. So if we plot mechanical strain versus temperature, uh, the in-phase behavior looks like that, out-of-phase behavior looks like that. So when we try to conduct uh, thermomechanical fatigue experiments, we have to be able to control strain and temperature at the same time. And this, this, can, this requires quite, quite a bit of controls, quite a good controls, uh, sophisticated controls. Some of the early data on thermomechanical fatigue is shown here. So this is strain range, this is fatigue life, right? So the isothermal results are shown here with solid lines. This is 1010 steel. This is not a railroad steel. It's a it's a, like a boiler tube steel, low carbon steel. So the, all the isothermal data is here, right? So the, this is, uh, it has the metric uh, numbers, uh, the units 204 degrees, 21, 316, 427, 538, 649. So this is the high temperature, of course. The fatigue life for the same strain range decreases as you go to higher temperatures. Now, the thermomechanical fatigue results are shown here on the left-hand side. Uh, in, in most cases, almost all cases, the thermomechanical fatigue lives are much shorter than the isothermal fatigue lives. So even, even, even for cases where the maximum temperature is like 538 Celsius here, which is which is lower than the 649. The maximum temperature in this test was 649, and here the maximum temperature was 5, 538. And uh, even then, the fatigue life is uh, much, much shorter. And the epsilon min at T max uh, means um, out of phase loading, of course. Epsilon max at T max means in phase loading. So this, this point here is an in phase point. This po these points are out of phase points. So there seems to be a bit of a crossover here, but we're gonna investigate that a little bit more. And uh, our work uh, is primarily on 1070 steel, which is a wheel steel, a perlitic steel. And the experiments uh, we conducted and the modeling we undertook, um, they were uh, uh, with, uh, my former student, uh, Richard uh, New, uh, his picture is shown here. That's a current picture. He's a faculty in uh, Georgia Tech. 
Uh, so you could see here in our results, we also getting, this is, uh, this is uh, out of phase and in phase results here. You could see that the, the in phase lives are shorter at short lives, but the, there, is, there is a crossover here that's a bit more evident and the out of phase results are shown, shown uh, to be lower at longer lives. So the, so in phase is more detrimental here, out of phase more detrimental here. There is an effect of environment. So we did conduct some experiments in a inert environment and the fatigue lives are longer. Uh, it's difficult to run these experiments, of course, but uh, clearly there is, a, there is an effect of uh, oxidation on the results. Um, typical uh, stress strain behavior is also different for out of phase versus in phase. So in the out of phase, you're heating the sample and you're going into compression, and that's the maximum temperature. And then, uh, and then you cool, and uh, then you are you are uh, you are in tension. So the in, in strain wise, your maximum strain and minimum temperature coincides here, and here the um, maximum temperature and the uh, minimum strain uh, coincide. So this is out of phase case. The in phase case is just the flip flip flop opposite of that, right? So uh, you know your your hot in tension and your uh, cold in compression, and uh, you could see there is a tensile mean stress here. There is uh, more a compressive mean stress here, but this, of course, your your uh, high temperatures in tension. This is more prone to um, creep damage. Uh, while uh, here, uh, your hot in compression and then. This is where you potentially form the oxides, and then the oxides can break when you go into tension. So there could be different damage mechanisms in, in out of phase versus in phase. So the examples of components experiencing high temperatures are listed here. Uh, most of the work we did on high temperatures involved railroad wheel materials, um, railroad wheels which undergo friction breaking. Uh, we have looked at um, super alloys as well, of course, um, and um, also aluminum alloys uh, in uh, in uh, automotive uh, engines, uh, cylinder heads uh, in particular, cylinder head materials. We have looked uh, a little bit at brake rotors as well. These are uh, mostly cast iron materials. Uh, cylinder heads mostly 319 aluminum alloys, railroad wheels uh, 1070 steel. So um, just wanted to make sure that you can hear me and see the slides. Can you say yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, Leonardo, we will instruct you because your camera, your uh, screen is a little bit bigger than um, we expected. So just a moment, please. One minute. Yeah, Professor, uh, do you remember? If you can go back to the screen where we have the conference room, uh, there. Did you click the the broadcast layout on the plus sign? The, yeah. Broadcast layout, yes. Yeah. Just give me one second uh, because on the on the streaming session, the screen that contains your camera is is the same size as the presentation. So. Let me, just one second, so I can see it if it it it, um, it updates here. Is it better? Yeah, just one second. Is it updated? All right, down. It's much better. Okay, thank you. It's perfect thank now. It's working now. Yeah, it's good. No, it's good. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, uh, were you able to see my previous slides? No problem, or with a yeah, problem? yes, we could see the slides. They, they were just a little small, but uh, now it's perfect. Okay, very good. So, uh, just to uh, point out that um, I have um, I have gone through the these slides, uh, showing some historical background and some definitions. And now I'm going to discuss some terminology. So is this good? Yes, just pass uh, to the presentation mode and everything will be okay of PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm going to press the presentation mode. How is this? 
Perfect. Thanks. Okay, very good. So uh, there's a terminology in high temperatures, and uh, we uh, we call uh, isothermal fatigue means uh, constant temperature. Non-isothermal fatigue means uh, um, either thermal fatigue or thermomechanical fatigue. Thermal fatigue means there is no external forces applied. Uh, the stresses are internal because of uh, temperature gradients. In the thermomechanical fatigue, we are applying external uh, forces, uh, external stresses. So that's uh, that has a mechanical load as well. So thermomechanical fatigue. The high cycle fatigue um, means the inelastic strain range, at least measured uh, at the macro scale, is roughly zero. Low cycle fatigue, the inelastic strain range is um, greater than zero. So that is. Um, that these are the definitions that people often use. Now, if we look at uh, some of the early experiments uh, at University of Illinois, um, which were done by uh, Professor Wettenkamp and his student, Simovich, they took a disk here. Uh, they make a small disk, like um, uh, I would say 10 centimeter disk. And this is an induction coil. And uh, this is a copper gasket. So they, uh, they, they cool the gasket and they, what they do with the induction, there's no external force here applied. They just heat and cool with the induction heater. And, and this is what we call thermal fatigue loading, TF. And you could see these radial cracks that form after a number, number of cycles. So this is one of the earliest examples of like laboratory thermal fatigue testing. Now, um, I want to discuss the fact that uh, the thermal stresses are generated by the application of the, um, at least in the in the freight wheels, uh, in the by the ap application of this uh, brake uh, brake shoe um, here at the tread region here. So the tread is where the temperature are highest. Temperatures are highest, and this is the rim region. This is the plate. This is the hub. And uh, you could see here, this is a curved plate, okay? So there's some flexibility here in the wheel to move. Um, if, if, it, if we look at this material here, an element of uh, material here, and we could think of that as constrained by the cooler material, right? So this, the plate and the rim, majority of the rim is uh, pretty cold. So if you heat that region, it's kind of, almost completely constrained as a first approximation. So the net strain is zero, but the mechanical strain is not zero. So when you, uh, when you heat, you go into compression here from zero, zero to A. And if you, your temperatures are high enough, it will yield. And then uh, you flow, you know, uh, plastically from A to D, and then you, uh, you cool you cool down and then you could you, you form elastically and you could yield in tension and you could get a, a tensile residual stress. So that's what's happening in the in the railroad example. It's a very, very simple approximation here uh, in terms of showing this model. Uh, but we have tensile residual stresses. If you heat back up again, you go along the dash line and then you heat, you cool, you heat, you cool and you get this hysteresis and you could get thermal mechanical fatigue here, clearly. And uh, this is called total constraint, the, pic the way the picture is. And this, this plot is stress uh, versus mechanical strain. So the mechanical strain is, uh, because the net strain is zero, is, is equal and opposite the thermal strain, right? So all of the thermal strain is converted to mechanical strain. Mechanical strain is negative, and you're, uh, you're hot uh, here, and you are in compression. So this is an out-of-phase loading. Right, hot, and, and uh, so the ma maximum temperature and minimum strain uh, coincide in this case. Some of these concepts are explained in this paper. Now, if we look at um, um, some experimental work, um, it's trying to simulate uh, the temperatures and strains in this B1 location. This B1 location is more or less uniaxial state of stress. 
So it's possible to measure the temperature there. And uh, if we impose that temperature cycle there, and then if we, we, we have a strain, we can make a strain measurement there as well. If we impose the temperature and strain measurement on a laboratory sample, uh, upon heating, you go into compression upon Cooling, you go into tension back in the second cycle, heating, and then cooling again. You could see that um, this material here, even in B1 location, um, of course, the stresses are not that high. This stress, uh, this is 200 MPa, uh, but there is a buildup of stress. So this is the temperature cycle, and this, this is the stress. This is actually, um, not um, a finite element analysis or anything. This is this is just applying temperature and strain uh, on a, a smooth laboratory sample and uh, looking at the effect of that. Now, other things can be done, of course. Um, if we look at uh, temperature versus time, you could have a, um, a history like this thermal block history. And in that case, uh, you know, as the wheel uh, rotates, uh, it sees the, uh, the high temperature input from the, 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 the brake, and the, the brake uh, is, is applied, and then it cools as it rotates. So it, the, it's history-wise, it goes through a cooling cycle. So, you know, it's possible that you know, there are lots of little cycles, heating and cooling cycles uh, when you apply the brake. It's not just a, just a heating, major heating and a cooling cycle, but there are lots of little uh, he heating, uh, quenching of that area uh, during the rotation of the, of the wheel because the rail cools that region, right, as, as, it, as the wheel rotates. And you could see here if we, uh, look at the maximum temperature against blocks to failure, and you could see the minimum uh, temperature is kept in the, this experimental work, of course, in the laboratory. Um, minimum temperature is kept 150. And if you didn't have these little sub-cycles here, uh, that's your fatigue life. And if you have these sub-cycles here, you know, 100 degrees, 150 or 200, as much as 200 here shown here, that blocks to failure goes all the way from 10 to the almost 10,000 cycles to about 100 cycles. So these little cycles, these little thermal fluctuations uh, that the wheel experiences, the thread experiences, could be quite damaging, uh, is what, uh, what we've seen here. This is, again, experimental work here. Uh, some of the nomenclature I just want to point out at high temperature. I apologize for the quality here. Uh, this is strain rate. This is strain. And this is the period of the cycle T, and this is time. And uh, strain rate uh, um, is related to the uh, cyclic frequency in the following fashion. So that's nu is the frequency of the cycle, delta E is the, uh, the range of strain, and the epsilon dot is shown in here. So it's important to know what the rate is in these experiments, because the material at high temperature is rate dependent. And that's what's being explored here. If we look at uh, like um, our wheel steel, 1070 steel, 600 Celsius, um, two, that's two times 10 to the minus six, one over seconds. This is two times 10 to the minus three, one over seconds. So you could see a huge uh, effect of strain rate on the mechanical behavior. So it's important to have a, a stress strain model, a constitutive model that uh, accounts uh, for this um, rate effect. At 400 Celsius, there's not much rate effect. Uh, there's some. Again, the higher rates give you higher stress. Uh, that's the lower rate experiment. These are, again, experimental results, but we certainly need a model for that too. As far as um, the wheel steels are concerned, of course, they are periodic steels. And um, if you expose them to 400 Celsius, uh, it, it still has a fine periodic structure. This, uh, uh, in the American uh, terminology, this is, uh, this is probably uh, a 
practically old wheel steel. This is like uh, untreated steel, class U steel. So there's class U, there's class C, which is rim quenched, and though that has even a finer pearlitic structure than this. Now the 600 Celsius exposure uh, spheridizes the material, so the, uh, microstructurally, the material is no longer uh, a lamella structure, which is higher strength structure. So the material actually gets soft, softer uh, with exposure to higher temperatures. And that uh, I think should be uh, should be noted. Now, typically the TMF testing, as I mentioned, um, you have a load cell, you have a hydraulic test machine, you need to measure the temperature. And um, I would, we used to use thermocouples, now we're using pyrometers um, and we have an induction heater. Both of them are controlled, the, the temperature is controlled and the strain is measured also with an extensometer. Um, and they are fed into a computer so that we could control the, the experiments. Those helium experiments that I mentioned earlier, at that time, we, we didn't have a vacuum system, you know. So what we did was we encapsulated the, the sample into in, in, by <clears throat> making these bellows and um, trap helium inside and then uh, use an induction uh, induction system to, to heat um, the sample and we had an extensometer outside the gauge section but we calibrated it with the extensometer by putting an extensometer within the gauge section so we were able to conduct those tests so this that's the thermocouple that goes inside this these bellows here this is again the, the very early work that we did one of the first works we did in fact uh, Richard New was uh, one of my earliest PhD students. Nowadays, of course, we have a little more sophisticated setups. This is a, a vacuum chamber. Um, we have a load cell inside. We have induction coil here, which is our dripping here. And this uh, big coil is not our induction coil. That uh, that um, cools the the viewing window that we have at the door. So the door of the uh, the vacuum chamber is not shown here. Uh, so we are able to make measurements remotely. In fact, we are making um, measurements of strain remotely as well with uh, the with, uh, with, uh, digital image correlation. But this is a high temperature setup that we have, that we have had for a while. Uh, we also have smaller setups uh, like this, but this is not for thermomechanical fatigue, but we could uh, heat, we have a heater for this and we could heat this, these samples and we could also heat these in, inside microscopes now. But it would be difficult to make thermomechanical fatigue testing with this setup. This picture, probably this is another setup we have for thermomechanical fatigue. I'm sorry, you, it's not easy to see the details here, but the sample is here, the grips are here. This is obviously not in vacuum chamber. And uh, that's our extensometer, and we have, um, we are putting speckle patterns and uh, and measuring strain remotely as well as uh, with the extensometer, so we can measure the local strains with the uh, with the, with the camera. But this is this is our induction heater in the back. You know, it's uh, that's uh, so this is a servo hydraulic machine. Load cell is up on the top. Can you see me and can you hear me? Would you comment? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can, Professor. Thank you. And mentioning that we had in-phase and out-of-phase uh, experiments, you could see that in the in-phase case, the, we get primarily creep damage. You know, that this is a perlite colony boundaries. You know, that's a perlite colony here, perlite colony here. There's the same thing, perlite colony here. You see the orientation of the lamella are different. So the in-phase TMF damage is primarily creep. Um, it's similar to like the damage you get in a creep test. On the other hand, in the out-of-phase case, OP and IF, it's dominated by oxidation damage, I apologize. So here you could see in the out-of-phase case, you have these oxide spikes that go into the material. And basically, um, in the out of phase case, you get considerable oxidation damage. And in the in phase case, you don't get much oxidation damage. It's, um, and um, 
just going back to, um, to our test, test again, it's good to see what happens in a, by using this kind of a two-bar model. So in the two-bar model, you have uh, A1L1, uh, which is heated, and A2L2, which is isothermal, and the net section load is P. So this will be like the rim and the plate and the cooler parts of the wheel. This will be like the tread region and the wheel, right? And it's, it's a smaller region, it's heavily constrained, but it's not a total constraint. Like I show there two rigid wall, right? That's an extreme case. So if I write the simple equations, equilibrium A1 sigma one plus A2 sigma two is equal to net section load. Compatibility means uh, uh, L1 time, the, the displacement here, displacement here, the same. L1 epsilon one equals uh, L2 epsilon two. The, the strain uh, in one is elastic plus inelastic, uh, inelastic meaning plastic, and the thermal is um, alpha delta T, right? Uh, but uh, the epsilon two is not being heated and uh, it's primarily elastic. That's what happens in a wheel. That's elastic. So we put epsilon two elastic here for epsilon two here. Epsilon one thermal is of course alpha times T minus T zero. T zero is uh, uh, the starting temperature, reference temperature. T is the current temperature. Alpha is coefficient of thermal expansion. As I mentioned, this is inelastic and this is elastic strain. If I uh, arrange this equation, I find that the strain, the, the total strain in uh, one, epsilon one, I'm interested, of course, what happens to bar one, right? So this is bar one, this is bar two. They are in series, right? So the bar one strain, total net strain, is minus sigma one divided by modulus into divided by this big constant C. And you could see C is A2, L1, A1, L2. It comes from those equations. And if A2 is very large, which, which would be a case where the material is more or less totally constrained. If A, A2 to A1 is a very large number, this is so large that epsilon one is practically zero. That's total constraint. So C goes to infinity total constraint, but if C is finite, um, then we have partial constraint. So as you heat this bar one, it's allowed to expand. That's good. And that's the, that's the design that people realize that they should not make these wheels, the, the hub of the wheel, the, the plate of the wheel so large and rigid. They made it more flexible. And as you could see, that's, called the plate design or the, di the dish design, or sometimes they call it the S, S shape. Um, and uh, so that wheel is going through a, a partial constraint, which uh, I show in the next diagram. This is the, the total constraint case, where the strain is, net strain is zero. And so you see the thermal strain, you know, you heat, you cool, you, you heat, you heat, you cool up, back and down. The mechanical is just, equal and opposite of the thermal strain, right? So the mechanical unit, you know, when you heat, mechanical is negative. And then, you know, by the way, this stress goes up and then the material properties, you know, the, as you keep increasing the temperature, uh, the yield stress decreases with increasing temperature. So actually the stress strain curve has a curvature like this, right? And, and then uh, you can see the stress drops and then you cool and then you heat, you cool. So this is between 150 and 600. This is 1070 steel. And uh, this is total constraint case. But again, note the temperature cycling from 150 to 600. But I take the same case, 150 to 600, but I allow partial constraint, right? This is uh, a, a laboratory experiment where you're allowing some free expansion, which is shown here. As you heat, you're allowing some free expansion. And in that case, the mechanical strain is much smaller than the thermal strain, right? That's the thermal strain, but you see the mechanical strain is smaller than the thermal strain by that by that amount, right? And then as you cool, you could you could it could also contract. So you could see the stress range is much smaller in this case, and the strain range, mechanical strain range, this mechanical strain range causes the fatigue, not not the net strain, of course. So the mechanical strain range here is much smaller. So co consequently, uh, partial constraint is more desirable. It is possible to use this two-bar structure to um, 
investigate a variety of different material behaviors. We're looking at just for thermal mechanical fatigue. But here we have bar one and bar two. It's a different, different kind of situation than a railroad wheel, let's say, but there's still a net section load. Uh, delta one, delta two are the same. We keep bar one constant temperature and we cycle bar two in this case. We start with a high temperature, we cool down and then heat back up, cool down. This is the basis uh, of developing these uh, design uh, diagrams, debris diagrams. Um, so you plot uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, in this case is denoted as theta, this is delta T, E, sigma Y. This is thermal load. It's called, a, sometimes it's called the secondary load in, uh, in design. And this is the primary load. And uh, that's the applied, uh, the applied uh, net section load here. So if you apl your applied net section load is here, anywhere here, but your thermal load is small and um, you get elastic regime, elastic behavior. It's, it's called high cycle fatigue. In the case of a um, little bit higher thermal loads here, you go up the scale here and you get a, a elastic shakedown. In the first reversal, you get plasticity, but after that you get elasticity elastic behavior, it's called elastic shakedown. If you have high loads and you have high temperature ranges, you get ratcheting in these structures. Uh, the PL here is the is the limit load. PN is the applied load, that's the limit load. Sigma Y is yield stress of the material. You get ratcheting here. And thermal mechanical fatigue occurs, uh, is a very specific case. Uh, it's the case of reverse plasticity and there the net section loads are not necessarily very high, but thermal loads are uh, are quite high. So with that through our structure, um, we conducted experiments long time ago to uh, and uh, observed like under the combination of this load and this delta T, we observed ratcheting, ratcheting, ratcheting. These are experimental results. These are, um, these boundaries are shown here based on uh, some simple uh, predictions, of course. Um, and then we're getting P means you're getting plasticity, S means you're getting shakedown, and E means you're getting el elasticity. So the ratcheting means something like this. Uh, you plot stress against strain, and um, you know, this is the cooling, and then, uh, and then heat, cool, heat, cool, heat, cool, and this, this just keeps going. And you could see that after a while, the whole net 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 assembly starts to move down, you know, in in, in, in the tensile displacements. And the ratcheting rate goes down. It's not as high as at the beginning, but nevertheless, these strains are uh, of the order of about two percent or so, and which is significant. This happens to be an experiment on three or four stainless steel. Um, I mentioned some other examples of. Uh, Thermal mechanical fatigue. This is the brake rotor cracking, and this is cast iron. And again, you heat, cool, heat, cool. So this is uh, um, obviously out of phase loading, and the uh, range of strain is 0.6 percent. And we we failed in 37 cycles. So that this is a different material, uh, but obviously there's there's cracking that initiates from that. In the case of uh, cylinder heads um, and um, in automotive engines, you're getting temperatures, of course, not as high. Um, well, here the minimum is 150, maximum is 500. This is quite high temperature. Not as high as wheels, but it's high. Here, the maximum temperature would be uh, less than that, of course. This is, uh, um, these are some experimental results. Uh, the maximum temperatures are around 250 or so in this case, but but the materials are different, the aluminum, aluminum alloys. These are some experiments we did and uh, and um, and some of the predictions we had at the time. Uh, and this is fatigue life, this is mechanical strain range. Uh, this turns out to be that uh, in this particular class of materials, uh, the uh, in phase is more damaging than the out of phase. So we have looked at uh, we've looked at that uh, in the case of cylinder heads.
Now, I mentioned that the stress strain behavior is a bit complex in these uh, TMS uh, kind of uh, histories. Um, we started with doing TMF, and uh, which is why one, my first project, of course, funded by the railroads. Um, uh, it was funded by the um, uh, Association of American Railroads, uh, and Slavic was my, one of my other students. And we tried to devise a, a stress strain model. I, I used inelastic strain because the inelastic strain means um, plasticity and creep are combined. Right, so I don't, we don't, we try not to distinguish between the two. And so this is stress, it's normalized. This is the inelastic strain rate. This is the power law creep regime, where you, if you ch change the strain rate, there's a lot of sensitivity um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the strain rate sensitivity, the stress changes quite a bit. This is the plasticity regime here, that's at lower temperatures and higher strain rates, where if you jump the strain rate, uh, the stress doesn't change very much. So this is, um, there are different equations, of course, for this. This is a power law relationship. This is more an exponential relationship. And this is all the data from 220 degrees to 700. Again, all this work is done. The initial work we did was on 1070 wheel steel. Okay. And that's the description. Now, um, that function is this function here. And this is uh, the stress, uh, deviatoric stress. And this is uh, activation energy, this is temperature, this is inelastic strain rate. This is back stress, um, which accounts for the Bauschinger effect, but it also deals with, uh, um, with the direction of uh, flow in the case of uh, hold times and things like that. It has an evolution, which has a hardening and a recovery. K is like a yield stress, the normalizing stress. That has a hardening and a recovery because, like, if the, in the case where there is spherization going on in the 1070 steel, this curve term, RK term, uh, will will not be zero. It will be significant. If there's cyclic hardening, it will be reflected in the HK term. This H alpha and R alpha are also obtained directly from experiments. So these are hardening and recovery of the back stress. So we could use this kind of a unified model. Uh, these were our experiments, of course, with a, uh, with a constant strain. These were our predictions. We needed this because to do a simulation, fatigue simulation, we need the stress magnitudes. We need the inelastic strain ranges and all that. So you could look at different cases. Uh, if, if, if you plot mechanical versus thermal here, if, if, if the loading is up and down like this is isothermal loading, if the mechanical and thermal uh, are uh, in phase, it's like this, and then out of phases can be different um, with a different trajectory. Here, you could see this is total constraint case. This is partial constraint. This is there are cases of over constraint. I didn't talk about that. But, uh, this is my uh, earlier picture again. That's my oxidation case. That's the out of phase case. You could see the intermittent uh, fracture of the oxide layers here, and uh, that's how the advance occurs. And uh, that's again the auto phase, this is the in phase case. We pointed out that uh, this uh, oxidation rates are not similar at the time we determined it to be a function of mechanical strain as well. So this is like a, a bit like a Griffith criteria in a way. So we devised an oxidation damage model. This is starting with new uh, I had a couple more students working on this um, at that time. And so the oxidation damage is a function of mechanical strain. That oxidation constants involve that critical um, um, size, the fracture size of the oxide. And then this is actually um, a factor, phi oxide depends on that th thermal history, the temperature strain history. Uh, temperature uh, strain time history in the cycle. So that's the oxidation damage. The creep damage is um, integration of the uh, hydrostatic stress, which would be the mean stress in the cycle, and um, and the effect of mean stress as well as the uh, meso stress. This is the effective stress in the cycle. Again, there's an exponent here. 
and like a creep exponent and that's the activation energy so that's the integration of this the, this term this damage terms here um within the, within the cycle and that gives us the a evolution of the creep damage uh, the fatigue damage part is taken at that time to be pretty standard this itself is obviously a very simple relationship which we have subsequently worked on to derive derive this relationship from simpler uh, you know basic principles but this is i would say this is the coffin uh, coffin manson normal equation this is the low cycle fatigue so it's the high cycle fatigue part so you you claim we uh, at that time we sum the damage fatigue creep and oxidation damage and try to predict the uh, the lives that's mechanical strain versus fatigue line and you could see these are different out of phase cases right minus a half that means the thermal mechanical ratio is minus a half minus two they're both out of phase here and the predictions are pretty good this is isothermal cases uh, <clears throat> slower rate uh, shorter fatigue life higher rate longer life um, we also um, conducted of course tests in, in a inert environment by running these inert environment tests we basically don't have the oxidation damage to then we can configure the fatigue and creep from that and uh, then then from the in phase and out of phase differences we can then assess the uh, the amount of creep damage that's going on so we systematically evaluated those terms based on these experiments this is an isothermal experiment you could see the helium results are up here again these are some experiments where the minimum is no longer 150 but like 400 500 550. there is a there is a code out there that um, that uh, is open actually people can sign up for it and use uh, our equations and, uh, and put uh, so because of the interest of time i'm not going to go to that website because that would mean I would leave the screen and I, I'm not sure if how well it will work. So this is E fatigue. It's called E fatigue. If you search that, you can put the initial uh, monotonic loading strain, temperature, time, the control mode, mechanical strain. Uh, you could choose total strain here too if you want. Then the cyclic part, you put the strain, temperature, and delta T. Again, control mode here. Same equation, stress strain relationship fatigue damage, creep damage, oxidation damage. It plots the temperature versus strain, what you've inputted here, and the cyclic part here, shown here, plots the loops, and it gives you a fatigue life estimate. So in this particular case, it's, um, um, we are um, hot in tension. So this is an in-phase case, right? So the, 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 the stresses are uh, decreasing. This is the high temperature end of the cycle here, considerably. So this is stress versus mechanical strain, and it gives a fatigue life of about 544 cycles. So this is what's uh, kind of predicted from this. Now in the database, the main material is of course 1070 steel, which is real steel, but you'll, you'll see a couple of other materials there, two, three other materials there that that could be, you could, one could pick any of these materials. Again. E fatigue it requires a, a sign in but uh, you can create an account and sign in uh, and then you you press uh, thermal mechanical fatigue analyzer that one and uh, well now how are we doing in terms of time professor Bartolomeu. we are we are we are okay uh, okay. Yeah, don't worry about that uh, because we I'm have some issues. I'm going to talk a little that... bit no, no, don't about worry. rail rail fatigue and ratcheting now. So great, this is, great. Feel free so this to is rail, as you know, all, all of you know, this is uh, the wheel. Okay. Apologize here. So the issue here is uh, that uh, we get quite a bit of flow. You know, in the in the rail material here, and the material that was straight here initially is now curved 
because it is considerable amount of shear strain here, right? But this is ratcheting. It's called uh, sometimes it's called texture. Material gets oriented as well. The, the grains get oriented that way. Again, uh, again, more or less, these are um, similar materials to wheels, uh, perhaps a little higher carbon content. This, these are TEM pictures. So the, the perlite spacing is a little bit finer here compared to the previous pictures I showed, there were, which were scanning microscope. These are transmission microscope pictures. This is 200 nanometer. So um, the, the issue is, of course, this, uh, I'm sorry about that, deformation of the surface. And um, we define the ratcheting strain as the accumulated residual shear strain in the direction of motion of rolling. Uh, these are the papers we have on this. Uh, probably uh, this one, uh, which we call model for rolling contact failure and the rolling contact analysis with the application of a new plasticity. So the key thing here is to have a, a good constitutive model that predicts this, uh, this ratcheting. You could, you could do that in a <clears throat> semi-analytical way, uh, or you could do it in finite elements but even if we use finite elements, we need the right constitutive model, which does not um, exist in commercial codes. But we we have a model that we implemented in, in the codes. And uh, but I want to mention that this, of course, is an important problem, in especially in rails. And the fundamentals are probably given best in this in this book by Johnson. And uh, here is your contact patch. Uh, He's showing just uh, normal stresses here, of course, it's like pure rolling case here, but you could have shear tractions. And uh, the thing is this, uh, the, as the way from the contact, you, you have a shear stress in uh, one direction. And then uh, when the contact is under the point, you, you get more or less the pummeling, you know, like you have only um, very high compressive hydrostatic stresses and then as the contact exits this region, you get shear in the reverse direction. So it's, it's shear, push, and shear in the reverse direction. So it, uh, history is um, uh, a three-dimensional one. The stresses are three-dimensional. Uh, we have tau xz is the what's called the orthogonal stress, and uh, that's important for fatigue. Sigma z is the normal stress. Sigma x and sigma y also exist. And uh, as I point out here, I I'm putting the direction of loading here at an at an angle here, so there there are shear tractions as well as normal tractions. The student I had who worked on this uh, is Yan Ya Jiang. Uh, he's he's a professor at uh, University of Nevada, Reno. He that's what his affiliation is now. So the surface ratcheting, um, this is normal uh, multiplied by the shear modulus, normalized by the yield stress and shear times uh, half the contact patch here that's used here, number of cycles here. So we have a, clearly a model that uh, predicts the, the ratcheting. So this is Q over P zero means pure rolling, no shear tractions. And Q over P equals, well, minus 0 0.1, 0 0.1. This, this is the difference between driving and driven. Uh, so nevertheless, uh, as, uh, we increase the shear tractions, uh, you could see the ratcheting rates are inc increasing considerably. In fact, uh, the key is what happens after many, 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 many cycles, because ratcheting per cycle could be small, but we are looking at, we were looking at developing models that would hold for tens and hundreds of thousands of cycles. So here I should point out that the P naught over K equals nine in this case. So this is well above the shakedown or elastic region. So there's plasticity going on underneath the contact here. Okay. P naught is the peak uh, Hertzian pressure. K is the yield stress and shear. And let's look at some fundamentals of ratcheting. So ratcheting means the the net uh, irreversible displacement or irreversible strain per cycle. That's the history rule. And if we uh, see the cycle three here, this is cycle 256. So it does decrease with cycles. 
intense seven is still not necessarily a material, but but there's still ratcheting here, right? And um, we're but the situation we have is very complex. It's a multi-axial and also it's non-proportional. Non-proportional means the uh, <clears throat> the plane of maximum shear is rotating. It's not not constant. Um, so we are also interested in long-term ratcheting uh, and also multiple step loading. So um, for Q over P equals zero, as you know, the maximum shear stress range is below the surface. So that that would be the uh, uh, that 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 magnitude uh, should be like around here, 0.5, okay, somewhere here below the surface. As we increase the uh, shear tractions, the point, uh, the maximum shear stress range moves to the surface. P over P equals 0.3. The maximum shear stress range is on the surface, and its magnitude is about 0.6. It's normalized, but uh, with uh, respect to the contact pressure, but it's 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 going up. So one can get ratcheting, of course, in in the in, in the pure rolling case, as well as in the case of uh, finite shear tractions. We um, developed a constitutive model, and this is a semi-analytical calculation similar to Mervyn and Johnson, who were the first to do this in 1963. And this is our residual stress profile that we calculated with our proposed constitutive model. The finite element at the time, this is not a ratcheting calculation. This is just uh, like, one cycle, okay, uh, one one pass, and um, and we note that our results are uh, such that we get uh, protective uh, uh, residual stresses in sigma x and sigma y. They're compression in compression, and that that's well known. And here the p naught over k is four, and q over p is shown here, and then. Uh, and here the P naught over K is a little bit different, but ma magnitude wise, you, you, we could see that we have good agreement with the finite element results, um, which were conducted uh, by others. Um, and we, we point out that um, Mervyn Johnson also captures some of these stress fields, but not, not, uh, uh, not the sigma X component as noticed there. Now the, the path that, okay, so the constitutive model that we've developed, of course, are uh, listed in these two series. This is Journal of Applied Mechanics, ASME 1996. Again, this is my um, history. So this is uh, shear in the other direction back to zero. So this is one path, so to speak. And this is a non-proportional loading because the stress and the shear stress Axial and the shear are changing in a non-proportional way. That's the ratcheting the shear strain variation with with cycles. That's the experimental result. Okay, and one can do these experiments: uh, keep the axial stress constant, and then you know um, reverse the, the shear stress. One can do it's it gets complicated. You do this first, step one, and then you do step two you get uh, transient effects. So this is step one, it's ratcheting the, in, the, in, the, in the way it's shown here. Because uh, axial stress is kept constant, it should ratchet in the tensile direction. Tensile, tensile means stress, means tensile ratcheting. But when we go lower the stress, still tensile, it starts ratcheting in the other direction. So there's a very, material does very, very complicated things, right? So we wanted to develop a model that captures all of these behaviors. Uh, we said that the ratcheting rate decreases with increasing number of loading cycles. That was clear here, right? So, I mean, between 1,000 and 2,000, we ratcheted in the shear from here to here, but between cycle one and 500, we ratcheted a lot. Right? So there is, there, is a there is a gradual decay in the ratcheting rate and under multiple step loadings, the material exhibits a memory of the previous loading history. So we compared, um, first, of course, before we, we didn't uh, 
know uh, how other uh, models performed. This is Armstrong, Frederick. This is Shabush. Uh, this is an abacus. Shabush is Morozen, Garut, and this is Bauer. This is our experimental results. And uh, you can see that these, these models are just over predicting the ratcheting. They're predicting very high ratcheting. The ratcheting rate decreases with cycles, as we see. We need a model to capture that. Um, the plasticity fundamentals, uh, that's the yield surface. That's the back stress. That's the deviatoric stress. That's the yield stress and shear. This is the normal normality, uh, normal, um, normal to the yield surface, and that's the direction of the plastic strain. And the evolution of the alpha is uh, is uh, uh, is very important, and uh, typically it's uh, taken to be along the direction of the normal to the yield surface, but in reality it 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 is not. We, experimentally, one can verify that it is not. This is a consistency condition. Um, it's the evolution of the back stress that we spent a lot of time on with uh, Yan Yao Jie. And uh, we uh, postulated that, that this evolution, it, it can be broken up into multiple components. And that's, that's been known, but uh, if the value of alpha is, if the value of alpha is small, then it follows the normality. But if the value of alpha, if it exceeds that limiting surface, some characteristic limiting surface, then the, the alpha uh, kind of um, recovers a little bit. It, it tries to return, return to itself, returns closer to zero. As you see here, this d alpha is directed closer to zero. It wants, while here it's not directed towards zero. So that's one of the ways physically to um, incorporate this ratcheting rate decay. And of course, uh, that's another path. And that's the behavior. And I, I'm repeating myself there, I'm sorry. So this is uh, the experiment. This is the experiment ratcheting rate decay, the blue. And our model is here, right there. That one. So we, we're predicting the ratcheting rate decay. This was that experiment where we kept the stress constant, but uh, reversed the shear. These are, uh, you know, tin walled uh, cylinders, uh, tension torsion experiments, plane stress. Um, we had we have this capability in, in our labs, and uh, so the experimental result are here, and then our prediction that psi equals four again predicts that, and we show. Again, this behavior, the axial ratcheting, even we're getting some transient shear ratcheting in this case, which we were able to catch. Uh, the step to loading, uh, we're able to capture as well. Step one, step two, the decrease in the ratcheting rate initially, actually going in the reverse direction, and then after many cycles. The key thing is for us, was to run experiments in the 10,000 cycle region. Previously, people ran tests like five cycles, 10 cycles. Well, the five, 10 cycles will tell you one thing, but it's the long-term ratcheting that's important. Um, this, so that I talked about wheel and rail, and this is diamond crossings. Um, and they, they, they use different materials and for the purpose. They, they use typically materials that go under 20. This is a twin in a material. So we started working on twinning. Uh, I would say I'm to, the way I'm talking right now is more chronological, right? Late 80s, early 90s, thermomechanical fatigue wheels. And then mid 90s to late 90s, um, we worked on rails. And then 2000, Onward, we worked on these diamond crossing materials. They are iron, manganese, carbon materials. They can take up a lot of beading, a lot of plastic flow. Okay? They are far more ductile uh, and tougher than the, than, the, than the steels. They do go under twinning deformation. And twinning is, uh, like that's the, that's the twin, that's the matrix. 
you could get secondary twin, but this is primary twin here, yeah, shown here. A mirror sy symmetry across the boundary. And that's the twin plane, that's C. It, uh, the, the stacking is such, normally it's ABC, ABC. So, but you have here across the twin, you get, you get a mirror symmetry here. The C atom is here, C atom is here, that's the A. And these are uh, also called Hatfield steels, Hatfield manual steels. We apologize here. We, we show that we can predict their twinning stress. And they, the beauty of these materials is they, they show an upward curvature, which is, which is uh, unusual because, um, because the upward curvature typically is not observed. You know, we talk about downward curvature, but these, because of the twin-twin interactions, we're getting, um, uh, again, this is published in 2007, uh, we are trying to predict this twinning stress, which is here. We have the terms due to the twinning dislocations, and we have, and because we have twin surfaces, there are fault energies associated with that. So we incorporate that in a model. And and the, this, oh my God, and the, the, this is shown here, the, the, these are the energy barriers that we have to overcome as the twin as the twin grows in, at the, at the la lattice level. And we're able to predict the twinning stress. We, we did calculations for lead, silver, gold, copper, aluminum, nickel, palladium, et cetera, and also the iron manganese steels. Um, now I see I'm going um, a little bit past my time. And um, I think, um, don't worry. I want but uh, we we uh, we we are good. But I'm, are you good? I'm good. But are you okay with the time? It's okay for us. It's okay. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Please <laughs> please tell small. me to wrap it up when you're ready. Okay. So the so again, this is uh, work we did on. The, um, we spend a lot of time on these Hatfield steels, which are used in diamond crossings or. Uh, they also are used in what in U.S. they call the uh, frogs, F-O-R-G, frogs, you know. Um, it's, they're, I guess, special special track equipment, special track steels. In Portuguese, we call that alligators. Alligators, yeah, okay, same idea. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, the fundamental of fatigue is kind of, Fascinating, of course, you know, we're in a very, very empirical area, you know, in, in many regards. And, uh, but at the same time, we have to teach uh, the theory of fatigue to our students. So in the last, uh, starting in 2005, 2007, in this time frame, I started working on theory of fatigue. This is 2007, this was, this, this work started but then I also start, we started my, you know, my students. Um, you know, we mentioned that the fatigue starts from persistent slip bands, that's well known, it's observed, and, uh, and it's a result of irreversibility. So if we have a source, dislocation source here, if, it, if, if from the source, if the dislocation is emitted, it goes to C, and then on the way back, if it reacts with dislocation of opposite sign, it's annihilated. So this path, like S, C, on the way back, you go to B, and it's annihilated there, but it doesn't go back to S. And here, same, from the source here, S, I go to A, this location moves this way, and it reacts with the dislocation of opposite sign here, it, it gets annihilated, and, uh, and so it doesn't return. So this, so the, in this path, simple path, the irreversible part, it's clearly SA and SB, okay? That's the part it didn't turn. The total path is SC, CB, and then SA. So that's an irreversibility parameter. And we can determine that with modeling, right? If the irreversibility was zero, we wouldn't have fatigue because it, the moves comes back, but it doesn't come back you know, fully, and we get irreversibility. This irreversibility is a function of gamma. So some of these ideas were forwarded uh, back in the 80s. Um, 
and some models have been developed, uh, like the Muratanaka model, uh, which uh, deals with dislocation pile up at grain boundaries. This is a bit like a Griffith criteria. <clears throat> so this is uh, cycles to failure. That's delta gamma to two power, and then this is uh, uh, like uh, specific fracture work, uh, work to fracture. It's like Griffith uh, fracture energy. So you could see this is the low cycle fatigue relationship, uh, more or less, the coffin manson type of relationship. The thing about the, these models is that uh, it assumes that the grain boundaries uh, are pretty much rigid. You know, it. Uh, it, it's based on the premise that uh, there's significant dislocation pileup at this boundary and at this boundary, which is good for as a first approximation. But uh, we're looking at materials, uh, we start looking at materials which show a lot of uh, scatter in the fatigue lines. How could we develop models that account for this, this uh, scatter and predict the line? So what we notice is that you know, slip can transmit through some grain boundaries. Uh, so there's no kind of irreversibility there, but there are some grain boundaries that are, that can be rigid or difficult to penetrate through. And that those are being shielding boundaries. And one needs to account that it's these other boundaries where the, the crack cannot transmit through. And then we have uh, the onset of crack initiation. These, these are examples of, of, a, of a crack forming within, uh, within, the, within a grain that's favorable, uh, but to the, to the applied loading, uh, slip plane, and then it's, it, cannot, it cannot readily transmit. And there are some rules about uh, the way uh, slip transmits, and uh, this is slip coming in here, this is incoming, this is outgoing, B1 and B2, and then there's a residual here. The residual is the difference between the incoming and the outgoing. If that residual was zero, then we would have reversibility, but, but we have irreversibility because of grain boundaries. So we um, said, uh, we, we, we proceeded to uh, study these grain boundaries and how they, uh, affect the uh, uh, irreversibility. So this is a digital image correlation image we um, uh, took um, on one of our samples. These are the grain boundaries. You could see here the strains in the, the slip bands here. This is shear increment on system 10. There are 12 slip systems in face center cubic materials. It's high here, but it cannot go into the next grain. So it's blocked. When it's blocked, there are very high stresses that are developed there. And this is conducive to cracking here. So that is, that's what, what we're seeing there. And we see examples of this, um, uh, you know, the cracking phenomena associated with special kind of boundaries. You know, special boundaries where there are, uh, there are finite residual stresses. These are the residual, residual dist um, Burgers vectors. And these are the residual Burgers vector that are calculated at these boundaries, and when they are large, one can get uh, conditions conducive to cracking. You could see this in these strain images in digital image correlation, if the grain or if your grains are large enough. So that would be the characteristic uh, fatigue crack initiation. Uh, we would predict. We would predict. We, we need to predict that LC, so to speak. That's we call it the cluster size. And the boundaries are all over the place, right? There are different boundaries. You can. You can map out all the residual burgers vector at each boundary. So the ones that are um, conducive to cracking would be the ones that are high up here. You know, the, and this can be determined from the microstructure. And you could see here the persistent slip bands and that, that's the point of initiation. So we established these grain boundary in, for different grain boundaries, the energy of these boundaries, and um, that's the energy of the grain boundary. And we, there are different boundaries, 5, 9, 11, 17, and uh, perfect FCC is here. If you, if we deviate from the perfect crystal, that we have finite boundary energies that need to be overcome. And that's the kind of energy that needs to be overcome for the slip to transmit through. 
So that's the energy barrier. And we established that for sigma 7, 11. Um, this is um, a number that it's called coincident site lattice. Number seven means every seven atom is in coincident site lattice at that grain boundary between the top and the bottom grain. And we established the transmission barriers. We established the nucleation barriers. This is the static grain boundary energy. This is the energy to nucleate it, this location. Previously, this is the energy to, to transmit through the, to, through the boundary. And then we go back to our persistence to plant and we develop an energy model with uh, continuum terms and the non concave terms. Uh, this we, we say molecular dynamics here, but these are energy barriers that are obtained. But the formulation is, um, you know, running on a on a desktop computer once we we have everything, and then we meet, we look for the minimal of this energy to get uh, the condition for onset of uh, fatigue crack nucleation, and this is also outlined in this paper. So this is 2011, roughly. I don't want to go into the details of this; uh, they are in the paper. But we're looking at cluster of grains like this. Two grains. Three. We're looking at all possible combinations. Which one, you know, whether whether this will give the shortest life or whether this will, this large grain surrounded by small grain gives the shortest life. So we 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 do calculations for grains that have low, lower than fifteen thousand life, higher than fifty thousand life. So we then, of course, the one that gives you the minimum life among all these simulations. And we can arrange the grains in different ways and, uh, and get the evolution of the energy term. That's the energy versus cycles. That's the criteria for, um, it's not the first time it goes through zero. It's that's the unstable equilibrium. This is the stable equilibrium point here. That's the fatigue life prediction in our case. This is for Hastelo AX. So we can, we can see that that this this scenario gives you a lower life, large grain surrounded by sigma three boundaries, which are impenetrable practically, gives you a lower life than that's this condition, a smaller grain with grains that are easier to penetrate. And we can predict this scatter more or less. I mean, there are a lot of experimental results here, the blue points, and the red is the the predictions. It's difficult to run this many experiments, of course, you know, it takes a lot of time. And uh, there are, so there aren't as many experiments here, but the simulations gives you the, this is again, normalized strain versus cycles to failure. So that's my last slide. I thank you for your patience. Uh, I try to summarize probably uh, 28 years of work, almost 30 years of work. Started with thermomechanical fatigue. It is. It still remains a very complex problem, no question about it. Rail ratcheting, advanced modeling is needed to predict long-term ratcheting. And fatigue modeling, introduced methodology to model persistent slip bands, uh, energetics in order to predict the fatigue light scatter. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.